I'm Phil Hill. And I'm Michael Feldstein. Welcome back to eLiberate TV. The MOOC phenomenon is fairly new. It was just in August 2011 that a course called Introduction to Artificial Intelligence was taught at Stanford. And the two professors, Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig, opened up the course to enrollment from anybody in the world for free. Based on this course, which drew 160,000 participants, Sebastian Thrun decided to leave Stanford and create a company, Udacity. At the same time, two other professors from Stanford who were doing similar work, they left and started Coursera. Several months after that, Harvard and MIT came together and formed a nonprofit joint venture called edX with the same objective of delivering massive open online courses. Of course, it hasn't all been a bed of roses. Increasingly, we're seeing faculty pushback and rising concern about issues ranging from the quality of education delivered in MOOCs to challenges to labor structures in colleges and universities. At Educause 2013, we spoke with Amy Collier of Stanford University to get her perspective on MOOCs. We're here with Amy Collier from Stanford University, and we thought we'd mix it up a little bit and bring Phil back into the conversation. So Amy, you work in an, an elite institution that's MOOC central, basically, but your background actually is uh, more wide ranging right. than that, right? right? You actually, before you were at Stanford, you were working with at-risk students in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. So given that range of experience, as an educator, somebody who's interested in bringing uh, technology in the service of education. What's interesting to you about MOOCs? One of the things that MOOCs has done at this moment is raise the profile of online learning. Like up to this point, online learning had kind of been this thing that other universities did to reach a, a non-traditional population. It was kind of this shunned thing in many ways. It was kind of this uh, not appreciated form of, of education. And I think what MOOCs have done is actually raise the profile in a very positive way to help us see that Online learning is for a lot of different people. The thing with MOOCs is that right now they really only serve a very small population of people. They serve people who would be successful in pretty much any learning environment. And so one of the things that's really interesting to me is how can we learn from what we've done in the past, I mean online learning is not new, to help shape what's happening in all kinds of online learning experiences, not just MOOCs, that does serve the needs of different populations because if we're only going to reach professionals who need lifelong learning, we're not doing anyone a favor. Now, Phil, Amy is obviously someone who's thought about this yes. a fair bit and is in an organization that's steeped in this. When you look at the broader landscape and you talk to different schools about why they're talking about doing MOOCs or why they're talking about why they shouldn't do MOOCs, sure. what are you hearing are the reasons for doing them or not doing them? A lot of the time, it's because Stanford is doing that. Uh. A lot of schools look up to not just their peers, but then to other schools. So Stanford has taken a leading role, not just in MOOCs, but in creating an organization to learn from this and figure out how to apply it. So some of the reasons for it is because they know there's something there, and Stanford, Harvard, other schools are doing it. But there's a wide variety. So if you get down to community colleges, they'll have a more specific reason. We're trying to reach out and provide access to you know, the other populations that can't get here or community development. So often what happens is it's the president or the provost or maybe a dean coming back saying, we're doing MOOCs. Yeah. And then people say, oh, we are? Why? What are we trying to catch up with? So that's probably the biggest differentiator is whether or not it's sort of a decision from on high saying we're doing it, now let's figure it out, or whether there's a determination to say let's work inclusively to figure out should we do MOOCs, and if so, how should we do MOOCs? And that's a really good point. You know, at Stanford, it started from the bottom up. I mean, it really did start from the faculty on up, and that's why the momentum stayed so strong, I think. And I do agree that a lot of universities have chosen to do MOOCs kind of from the top down. I get to ask to speak at a lot of these places because they want me to come in and help 
with the faculty buy-in because there are ways to talk about this that make sense to faculty. Sure. But if we don't approach it that way, then it just comes across as this thing that we're doing because of marketing or this thing we were doing because we want to increase our enrollment or things like that. Sure. You know, and Stanford really recognizes what you were just saying about um, the role that Stanford plays in this moment. And we recognize yeah. that one of the important ways that we can contribute to this moment is by de-risking the innovation part of this because a lot of universities feel different pressures than we do. And so if we don't feel the same pressures, at least we can help to maybe mitigate some of those pressures that they're experiencing. So Phil, we've talked about a positive environment sure. where faculty are interested. We talked about a neutral environment where faculty want to know more about MOOCs. Let's talk about a more skeptical environment. Okay. So what are the concerns that we're hearing about MOOCs and what are the points that the skeptics are bringing up? One of the first things is to understand that MOOCs are, a, you know, a pilot is one way to look at it. They're, they're a new form from the open enrollment, the massive different user populations getting involved, even though there's a lot of lessons common with online. Um, and so as you look at that, one of the big issues that's come up is the completion rate. Um, is the completion rates are typically quoted as 10% or less of students who are completing the course. Now there's sort of a counter argument saying but there are different students with different needs. Some students have no desire to complete the course so why is that a problem that they got professional you know development but they didn't complete the course. Mm -hmm. But that controversy of the completion rates under 10%. Right. It's a real issue. It's oversimplified but it's one of the big controversies. The fact that there's a lot of talk around MOOCs about super professors, that um, we're going to come down to just within a given discipline, a handful of teachers and everybody will use their material. That has introduced a lot of labor issues with faculty as well, saying, wait, this is just a way to get rid of my job. Man, what is your motivation for doing it? Are you trying to slip something under the door and then it's going to expand? Mm -hmm. So labor issues, and it's not just labor, it's even what's the richness of learning. If you do go to a world of super professors and not having local instructors who know their student population, know their needs and know how to customize it, there's a big question about are we going to create the McDonald's of education? Mm -hmm. So certainly that's another um, quest, uh, controversy. And then um, you also get the thing of, this is all about cutting costs. This is just a way for top administration to deal with the budget issue without confronting other issues outside of the cost of instruction. And so there's a dynamic going back and forth of all you're doing is cheapening education in order to cut costs. Mm. That's obviously not always true, but that is one of the controversies that gets out there. Yeah, and I think the more that universities can talk to each other about how they are talking about these issues, the better. You know, yeah. I, I certainly wouldn't want this to be the case where great dialogue is stimulated by the fact that there are so many controversies associated yeah. with MOOC. And then nobody talks about it because everybody's trying to hide behind our institutional priorities, our institutional competition goals, whatever they are. We really need, and maybe that's the role that we play, but hopefully it's not only our jobs to go out and say, let's really push this dialogue forward. Uh, we really need that dialogue to be open, transparent, you're exactly right. Yeah. In this discussion where it's so intense right now of the hype of MOOC and then the arguments against MOOC, sometimes we lose the little wins that I think are actually significant. In other words, as we've moved into this open education being a mainstream subject, it's interesting the fact that there are a lot of people with a real desire to learn. That when you create engaging storytelling and engaging multimedia instead of a dry textbook approach that really engages people. One other thing is the very fact that lectures are a central piece of MOOCs, but students can now re-watch it, watch it on demand. They can speed it up. They can control their experience of the material. It's simple, but MOOCs are doing this at scale. And so there's a lot of positive lessons that can be learned or applied based on the little things that are happening. And I hope that we don't lose sight of a lot of these benefits just because of the controversy. So I definitely agree that we don't want to just have a conversation about the controversies, but we need to be honest and transparent about them. So as you think about 2014, what's the one trend or experiment or idea that you're most interested in seeing developed or seeing the outcome from in the next 12, 14 months? 
I think you mentioned earlier, Amy, about the fact of MOOCs, their natural audience to date has been uh, lifelong learning, right. which there's nothing wrong with that, but that's really not the mission that they wanted to right. serve. Um, so I think that what we're going to be seeing and what I'd be interested in 2014 to see how far it goes is there are various experiments and models to see how can and should MOOCs impact credit bearing right. courses. How can it actually help with the access and the learning potential within a degree granting program? We've already started to see various experiments happen this year, but 2014 to me is gonna be all about seeing whether any of these pilots and concepts start to show promise, start to stick, start to, you, you mentioned the fact that you guys like to take the risk away. Is there gonna be a school who's gonna be able to sort of take the lead and apply something and say, hey, we're getting some great results and here's what we had to do to get these great results. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I'll be looking for within uh, degree granting programs. I think that we might also see a lot of movement on the admission side of things. So you're talking about the completion side of things where institutions are going to start thinking about how MOOCs can be used for degree completion and things like that. I also think they're going to be looked at as ways to get entry into certain kinds of programs, certain kinds of schools. I think we're going to see more and more people or schools experimenting with this idea of MOOCs as entry points to jobs, degree programs, universities. So almost picking up from uh, the University of Helsinki program, they actually have done some experiments with a MOOC that they felt that, hey, beyond just standardized tests in the application, right. if students take a MOOC, we can actually look to see what their knowledge base exactly. is, and they're using it as an additional factor or criteria to say which of these students could succeed in our right. environment. So, and uh, we have to be cautious about this, right? Because if if it becomes if the MOOC becomes what the SAT has been, which is a restrictive, uh, hierarchical uh, test that keeps some people out and some people in, we need to think about that, right? I, I, we 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 need to make sure that we're making we're putting the right MOOCs and the right entry points in the right way. Otherwise, we're just going to keep widening inequality, and that's not what we want. So it sounds like we have an exciting year ahead of us with a lot that we're going to learn. Amy Collier, thank you for joining Phil and me on eLiterate TV. We heard a lot in this episode about the need to have thoughtful conversation about where and when MOOCs are appropriate. We need your help in that. Tell us where you think MOOCs might be useful or if you think they might be useful in your institution. Where's the right place to start?